Hi, David. I'm Kiki Latimer. I'm the host of the Catholic Bookworm. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And let's see, we pronounce your name High Duck. Yes. Right? <laughs> I live on a pond, so that's easy to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of those creatures around here. So, And you are the author of Healing the Culture and the Family. Yes. Which I just finished reading about an hour ago. Um, have loved it. I'm going to start oh, out thank loved you. it. Thank you. Um, I have always, for, for years now, I've said my, um, I think the two most amazing things ever written are the Summa Theologica and Theology of the Body. <laughs> well, in this book, they sort of merged, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so they just like came together, which was really exciting, um, with some really great ideas. Um, so uh, I'm excited to discuss it with you. Thank you. You, you. you packed a lot of information into a small book, um, which is wonderful. Thank you. Actually, that comes from the fact that um, I did my doctoral work in, in the British system. I actually got my doctorate from Maryville Institute in Birmingham, England. And one of the characteristics of the British system is that they, they really trim away all the fat. They don't want you to say more than you need to say for your argument. And everything is about the argument and that the argument of the dissertation is clear and yet concise. So, uh, so I really owe that to the fact that this was a reformulation of my doctoral dissertation. Um, so that nice kind of, you might want to say, streamlined book, but yet jam-packed with a lot of support for the argument really is the result of me having done my doc dissertation in England, I think. Awesome. Well, I'm going to have you tell us a little bit more about yourself, but do you want to begin us with a prayer to begin with? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for asking. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless our time together. May it work to extend your kingdom. And as always, we ask for the intercession of your Holy Mother. May she wrap us in her mantle and intercede for us always. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, tell me, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You started over in England. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that actually, well, I guess best that's where, not really where the story begins, I suppose. But yeah, so I, I live in New Jersey in the United States and um, pretty much lived here all my life. Uh, I live in Western Jersey with my beloved bride, Shannon, and we have 11 children. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've actually homeschooled from the start, so we're a homeschooling family. Yeah, um, I, that uh, too. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's always good. There's only four, though, <laughs> and a few of the neighbors' kids thrown in for good measure, always. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's really a, a great thing. Beautiful. It's been a blessing for our our life and our family. Um, of course, the children themselves, the first blessing, right? <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, um, I studied. Theology. I, I grew up uh, getting involved in, in youth ministry predominantly and went on to study theology and philosophy in my undergraduate degree from Seton Hall University. Um, went on to get my master's degree from the seminary at Seton Hall, Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology, uh, at which I became in 2008 an adjunct professor of, of moral theology. Um, I, I predominantly taught and worked in campus ministry on the high school level. Um, I bless so, you. <laughs> thank you. So uh, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that's been a real great grace of that is having to learn how to explain um, really challenging concepts uh, on a level that, that can be well understood that it's accessible without sacrificing substance, which is uh, mm. something that I think is very important. I think we we either shoot uh, with a language that is just not accessible to people, or 
we tend to water things down. And so I mm -hmm. just wanted to always try to hit that mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> some, uh, you know, some, some 30 years teaching now. Mm -hmm. So I did so, about a year and a half of teaching junior high and high school Catholic homeschool kids. Um, it was good. I mean, it's a challenging age group, like you're saying, that you don't water it down. Um, it's almost so that hormonal age where you're like <laughs> trying well, to get it's past funny. the hormones with the, get yeah, to the for sure. I mean, Obviously, all of that's involved, and they're like. Mm -hmm. Uh, asserting themselves as individuals and that separation is happening at home, but they're also sort of feeling out all the different possibilities for who they should be and what they should be doing with their life. And right. that in our current world is, of course, a very problematic thing, you know, right. <laughs> um, but but one of the things that I think is very important is that we provide them with really solid answers because the fact right. of the matter is we have a rich intellectual tradition. Uh, so often theology is not seen as a as a real subject. Right. Uh, it's and there's a whole intellectual history to that going back to the enlightenment but like the fact remains that because it's been sidelined as a real subject that even the kids don't consider religion a real class um i think we should we should avoid doing things that that entrench that idea in their minds and that is you know certainly by making it fluffy and and uh, almost sentimentalized and and not having really sound, solid reasons for what you're teaching or a philosophical or intellectual basis for what it is you're teaching, that just makes the argument that it's a real subject fall flat, you know? So um, so that I've never kind of operated that way, you know? Yeah, so, neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> so so in, my, in, my, in the foundations of theology class, I teach the freshmen, we do the five ways of St. Thomas Aquinas and and try to illustrate how, based on these metaphysical principles, we can know by reason alone certain of God's attributes that necessarily follow by logic. So, like, you know, it's like I try to do that with my freshmen, and they're usually surprised that there's such an answer, but nonetheless. Yeah. I was teaching doing a combination of virtue ethics and metaphysics with them, and I basically a lot of the same type things. Um, and they they love it when they really can dig into questions that have answers and that resonates truth with them right it's fascinating right so then uh you know to back to the story i went on to go and get my doctorate degree um from maryville institute in birmingham england you know it was a really wonderful and lovely experience for me at the time and uh and and so i've still continued to teach high school uh and work in in um an apostolate now as the director of theology and evangelization apostolate called the Ray of Hope, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful apostolate doing some wonderful work. And my job for them basically is just reviewing content, producing content, being involved in the podcast, the Reason for Hope podcast that we have and, and making videos of you know, catechetical nature. So it's been good in addition to my teaching and then the adjunct work at the, at the seminary. So nice. So you're busy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you have 11 at home still? Uh, no, they're not all at home. No, we have seven at home. Four are grown and okay, out. What's the youngest? The youngest at home is five. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a busy life. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's great. Yeah. So we have, um, we have 27 down to five. Okay. Uh, I, I used to say, if there's an age you like, come by my house. You're bound to find it. <laughs> Well, I've got 13 grandchildren now, so it's, it's, we're back to having, you know, the kids around, so it's good. Yeah, we have two grandchildren. Thanks for the yeah. Nice. So in the midst of all of this, you found time to write Healing the Culture and the Family, uh, which has a lot of explanation, obviously, of John Paul II's Theology of the Body, right. which is, one, like I said, one of the most exciting things probably written since the Summa Theologica. So, uh, and you've combined the two. Um, so, yeah, so how did you, you, one of the first questions you sent me was how did you get into this in the first place? What brought you to such an interest in this? Well, I think first is why I came to appreciate John Paul II's work. Um, John Paul II, especially uh, his work in respect for human life, and um, marriage, sexuality, and the family 
were really instrumental to my wife and my conversion, uh, which which actually happened simultaneously, which is really lovely. And so you're converts. Cool. Yeah, not converts in the in the you might want to say technical sense. Like I was born and raised Catholic. I grew up in the church. I actually was involved in the church and involved in in ministry, but I would call myself a cafeteria Catholic. How's that? Okay, right. uh, I was born in 1970, grew up, came of age in the early 80s, was a very interesting time in the church, as you probably know. So uh, I'm a convert. So oh, you're a convert. Well, there you go. Came in, my husband and I came into the church in 85. Yeah, so there you go. So like when I was growing up in the church, but the church that I was growing up in was a... Um, was very much focused on a personal friendship with Jesus, um, but that's kind of where it stopped. The faith became very sentimentalized. Um, there was a, an, an exaltation of personal conscience that pretty much was the same as whatever you feel is good is good for you. <laughs> you know, like, uh, um, so, well, I get you really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, so, so basically, I was a cafeteria Catholic. You know that or I took the things that I liked, and I kind of just passed by the things I didn't. And my wife was baptized Catholic, uh, but raised nothing. And um, so, when we got married, that's kind of where things were at. And then, um, and then, when we were expecting our first child. Um, for whatever reason, the good Lord placed on our heart a desire to get involved in pro-life work. Okay. Um, that experience of that pregnancy was profoundly um, powerful. And uh, it was through pro-life work that we met a lot of like all in Catholics, you know, and, wow. um, and it was, it was a delightful thing to meet these wonderful people. And um and, and then what wound up basically happening was right around the same time, John Paul II came out with Evangelium Vitae. And I decided to read this encyclical, and I read it the day it was released, March 25th, 1995. And, and it so overwhelmed me, um, the power of it, the argument of it, and, and in particular, how he had such a handle on where the culture was at and what philosophically was underlying where people were thinking and why they were acting the way they were and where these ideas kind of came from and their root. I was just so struck. And I would say that that was a moment of, of powerful grace for me. Um, shared it with my wife and, you know, we just started to gobble up what <laughs> he wrote and share with each other. And that's what led me to basically say, look at, you know, either we, I'm all in or I'm out, you know, like, but if I'm all in, then this is the vision for our family. And she was like, absolutely. So she came wow. to be fully initiated into the church and we committed ourselves to really having John Paul II's vision for the family and for marriage be the foundation of our mission as a couple and as a family. And, and of course, I was so profoundly struck that it had to become like almost a personal mission for me in my work to share what I was learning. So I think that that's like really how I, I came to focus on teaching the work of John Paul II. Um, you know, this particular book, like I said, that arose from my doctoral work. I mean, in that sense, it's been something I've been thinking about for, you know, a decade since my master's right. degree, you know, like, um, I think comes from the fact that I was always, like I mentioned about Evangelium Vitae, profoundly struck by John Paul II's insight with regard to the culture. Like he was really in tune with where the culture was at, but, but more importantly, he knew the intellectual history, the philosophical history of why the culture was at where it was at. Right. You know, <laughs> and, and this is seen in a lot of different works that he's written. Mm -hmm. Um, so then when I read Letter to Families and I got to this paragraph number 19 and I saw him talk about this new Manichaeism that was being experienced by the human family and that, that that talk about a new Manichaeism was nestled right in the heart of his overall critique of Cartesian rationalism. So before I let you go any further for our <laughs> audience... <laughs> Why don't you give us a, a, a quick idea of what the old Manichaeism was and how it relates to the new 
and right. throw the cart in there for good measure <laughs> and give us an idea of where yeah. this, what you're starting with in the book. Yeah. So actually in the book, in, in what the, basically contemporary scholars of John Paul II's work have said that his work is, can be seen as particularly his anthropology, his, his writings on what it means to be a human person in light of the word of God and human reason. Um, is basically a response to Descartes as well as to Manichaean ideas and attitudes about the body and sex. Now, how are those related to each other? And well, because they converge, these ideas of Descartes and Manichaeism sort of converge in Letter to Families 19, which forms the basis of the book that I've, I've written. Um, but basically the old Manichaeism was an ancient, for lack of, for, for simplicity's sake, because it's much more complicated, you know, in the book, um, and contemporary Manichaean scholarship would have some difficulties with this characterization I'm going to give. But nonetheless, like, basically it's an ancient dualist Gnostic heresy that um, sprang up from the East um, with Manny from Babylonia somewhere in the late, three third century so late 200s um and it really made its way into christianity and, and it, it it sort of was a very you might want to say um contending idea and and really you want to say pesky heresy in the early church in fact um your viewers might know that like saint augustine himself for a time was a manichae he was a manichaean auditor before his conversion to Christianity. Actually, before Faustus, who was a very famous Manichaean, didn't satisfy him intellectually in the questions that he asked, you know, classic Augustine. So, um, and this is the idea that basically matter, the body and matter in general, are kind of corrupt and evil, right? Yeah, like, so what you have is two, not the, the Gnostic, the dualist Gnostic heresy, pretty much all of them are the, there's a good God, you might say the father of greatness, the realm of light, the God of light. And then there's an evil God, this prince of darkness, which has e even been referred to as Hyle or matter. Um, and then uh, there, there was an attack of the evil God and on the force of the good God, the light. And that creation kind of sprung as a result of this cosmic warfare. And and so the material world that you see is fundamentally evil and either created directly by the prince of darkness, um, this evil god, um, or as a, you might want to say, a strategy to offset the, the, the evil god having its way with the light elements in order to, you might want to say, enshrine or protect the light elements. So, so no matter what you see, um, according to the Manichees, the visible world is evil and, and the light is trapped within it. So this is, a, this is an important view. This is why, by the way, uh, Manichees typically referred to the God of Genesis 1 and 2 to be you know, equ equivalent to this prince of darkness. Like, so that what we would call you know, the God of Israel who created heaven and earth, you know, like, um, they saw as the evil God. Um, well, I always notice this often, we still see this very often re more recently um, at funerals um, because we hear that the person's become an angel. You know, mm -hmm. the person has become pure spirit now and forget the body, you know, forget any concepts of resurrection of the body or being reunited with your body. It's the idea is to get out of the body. Right. Um, the very new agey. But it yeah, shows absolutely. up the Catholic funerals too, you know. No, absolutely. And and this is part of the difficulty when creation moves to the human being, who themselves, by the way, if you were to look at the Manichaean myths, are are created by basically an act of incest between the son and daughter of this prince of darkness, Great. is how Adam and Eve come about. So, like and, and and that's before this, the, the son of the Prince of Darkness actually consumes aborted fetuses of the archons in order to entrap the light. And so it's like really 
where you it's look at their bad men. story. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad story. And so what you, what you have is that the Manichees thought that, well, the, the very nature of the human race, the origin of the human race is from these repugnant acts of cannibalism and sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so therefore the body and sex particularly become like a principle of corruption and evil. And, mm-hmm. and thus the, the Manichees themselves, if you understand this, um, and overall this view of, of matter, you understand a lot about what the Manichees believed as far as morality goes, which was basically a total asceticism, a, a complete renunciation, right, of anything material, of the body, and of all things that could provide any kind of pleasure whatsoever. And then, of course, also their, the whole point of their ritual meal and their worship, which was to try to release the light elements from certain foods through the consumption of these foods by the Manichaean elect. So like you've got like this whole system that's based around these ideas. Now, of course, the question is that's all really nice, but what does that have to do with Descartes, you know? Yeah. Um, and in reality, what we you know, you don't see a bunch of Manichaean monks walking around and, and, being so super thin, they can, and actually, you probably wouldn't see Manichaean monks walking around very much because they actually would not move very much because they thought they might harm the light elements and the things that surrounded them. So they they lived a very relatively still life. And the auditors of the of the Manichees, those are the second rank underneath the elect, would actually help them and do all the work for the ritual meal and everything else. By the way, so just bring a, us to the new the new manichaeism yeah. how we're, that this sort of evolved into because I think yeah. that's important for your readers today. Right. So yeah, so the ancient manichaeism. When I talk about ancient manichaeism or even medieval manichaeism, like for lack of a better way of grouping them, like the Albigensians during the Middle Ages, that that the Dominican Order was founded to respond to, um, basically. We're not talking in Descartes like some sort of actual chronological new variant where it's an actual religion that can be traced to medieval Manichaeism or ancient Manichaeism. What John Paul II is doing is basically saying like Manichaeism is used almost like analogously as a term to refer to certain elements in that spring from Descartes' philosophy right on through into our contemporary age that have just become accepted um, in our thinking. So the first of those is anthropological dualism. So basically this idea that, that our bodies are not us, you mentioned this before, that, that, um, that somehow for Descartes, man was a thinking thing, that you know, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and, and so the body really didn't have anything to do with the person, the person was the mind. The thinking thing. Um, the body for Descartes was seen as pure extension, just mere matter. Uh, and that's the way Descartes saw all bodies in the visible universe. So there would be no difference between a human body and a body we'd call a tree or the body of an animal, you see, that all things in nature, all matter in nature um, are just mere matter extension. But Human beings are the thinking thing. Now, of course, human beings have a body. So Descartes saw them as associated with a body. But importantly, he didn't see the, the body as us. You see, so, so he didn't believe in what traditionally is known as hylomorphic theory, where the human person is, is, is one person, a composite substance of matter and form of you know body and soul with the soul being moving the body rather descartes held that a dual substance theory where we are we are mind one substance and body another substance related to it but not it so so why is this how do we see this today well yeah we see this today because people predominantly associate themselves with their mind. Uh, And even if they don't have a belief in a spiritual soul, uh, what they do think is that their real self is their consciousness, you see. So 
And this becomes really clear how this dualistic view of the human person plays itself out today. Um, because, because I not only, I not only think therefore I am, I am, as Christopher West has said, I am what I think I am. I found that really interesting. You know? yeah. And, and I this, I this, I leads, this leads to I think, think I'm a man, I'm a man, I exactly. think I'm... Exactly. You know, I'm an Indian, I'm an Indian. You know? So like in many, many ways, we can see how this plays out. It's whatever, and these are always associated with feelings, like whatever I feel like I am is what indeed I am. And that my consciousness is what um, determines what I am and not something objective like my body. But certainly the fact of the matter is the body has to catch up with what I think I am on the inside. You know, and and the body itself has relatively no meaning. And this is this is connected to the mecha mechanistic view of nature too, because if the body, like all things in the visible universe, has no real meaning, which Descartes did not believe in, you know, in classical Thomistic thought, what was called final causes, right? So so he didn't believe that there was an end or purpose for things that we could know, which of course Thomas did. Right. because he believed and he had a realist metaphysics that said we could recognize and cognize not only the existence of something in instrumental reality, but its essence to some degree, even if not in its totality. So, so basically, it, Descartes didn't hold that, which meant that everything in nature, we couldn't know what it was for, but that didn't matter because we were supposed to impose on the material world our ends. Now, if that's the way Descartes views all bodies, inclusive of the human body, because the human body is not me, it's just matter like the rest of the visible universe, well, then I can exert my own will on mine or other people's bodies, you see? Right. I can determine what the end or purpose is. And the, in other words, there's not an objective purpose I need to discern. It's merely subjectively applied. So... Um, what this winds up doing is creating a, a society, John Paul II said, in which people are used the same way things are used. And that the, our bodies become like raw material to be manipulated and changed and what have you to suit whatever end or purpose we have. And you can see that in bioethics with regards to like embryonic stem cell, destruct, embryo destructive cert, um, yeah. rather, embryo destructive, destructive research embryonic stem cell research. Uh, you can see that in, you know, even in in vitro fertilization or any kind of um, circumstance where you have, you know, where, where in the laboratory human beings are being created almost as like objects of technology or medical science. And then you can also see this in the current circumstances with transgenderism and um, the whole idea of transitioning, like somehow this is how I feel I am, so I'm going to take this body and mold it to match what I feel it should be, you see. Right. So, like, yeah. so in those ways, bioethics and sexual ethics uh, become particularly impacted by this view. Um, it, it's very interesting that it seems to, quote-unquote, work for people as long as I'm the acting person doing what I want to do. But it becomes very schizophrenic in the society when somebody does something to my body that I don't like. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's my body is me. So if someone touches me inappropriately, all of a sudden, my body is me. And, and so the whole, you know, the me too thing and my body, my choice, all those things relate to things that get done to me. And it becomes a very schizophrenic sort of thing. Where, you know, if someone touches me, well, I say, you touched me. You didn't touch my body. You touched me, you know. It's like trying to have a philosophy or a theology that doesn't work, right. you know, that eventually is going to run into problems. Yeah, I think that you're, you're, you're onto something there. And I think that this is a, how can I say this, by trying to be kind to the people who hold the view. I, I think that, like... This is very common today. Like, for example, we hear a lot about social justice these days. I, I, I agree that we should make sure that every human person is treated in a way that their dignity as a person deserves, right? I mean, this is just, right. yeah, of course. 
Um, but those same people will, are incredibly relativistic with regards to morality. Right. And to try to explain that, like, well, how can you say there's no such thing as right and wrong? And then all of a sudden say, no, there is a thing such called justice. You know, like, you can't, you can't say that there's something called justice, which you're saying is a real thing. Right. And yet hold the view that there's no such thing as right and wrong. And you can determine what's right for you and me for me. Like, yeah. you just can't do that. So I think it's similar to that in the sense that, you know, it's my friend Damon Owens, who's a popular speaker on the theology of the body. I, I quoted him in my, in my introduction. He says, we live in a, this is my body. This is not my body world, right. you know? And it's, it's a curious idea that at the same time as trying to say our body matters so much and is us, we then right on the other side of our mouth say, my body's not me and I can determine exactly what it is and what it's for and use right. it how I see fit, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Years ago, I, many years ago now, I attended a, a, a conference with V.F. Skinner. And he basically was saying, you know, we make our own rules and we, de we determine right and wrong, good and evil. And that was uh, the relativistic philosophy was underneath pretty much everything he said about behavioralism. At, and I remember at the end of the conference wanting to go up and steal his briefcase, just take it and have him say, that's mine. <laughs> and just wanted to say, well, I've decided it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've changed, you know, I've decided, I feel that it's mine. Right. Um, and, and how there was nothing in everything he said that evening that could argue with that. Right. You know, that was the logical consequence that if I decided my behavior was that I wanted his briefcase, I should be able to act on that and take it because it was not objectively his. He said, we, you know, we own things, but they're not objectively ours. It's yeah, and this is, I think... This is a natural consequence of this overall right. thinking, because if it, in the book I talk about how the new Manichaeism that kind of flows from the Cartesian tradition has this anthropological dualism, has this idea of a mechanistic view of nature, right? right. Where bodies are just mere matter that's being manipulated, including the human body. And then there's the rejection of an overall sense that God creates a world of substances that have a form and a characteristic activity and therefore tend towards a particular end that we can know. Um, and that naturally leads to this idea where if I can just determine what the reason and purpose for things are, it, it naturally leads to relativism, right? So, and John Paul II saw this in Love and Responsibility, which he wrote prior to becoming Pope. He believed that there was a short jump to one's um, to, to, you might want to say this same idea of a relativistic view in people's ethical views from this idea that overall things don't have um, purposes built in or a final cause. So, you know, he saw that. And I think that's what we see. If I can just impose my own will on nature, then, then I can just determine for myself what is good and what is evil. Because if God is not giving us the meaning and purpose of things, then he also isn't giving us what is good and what is evil, and that's for me to determine. And then, of course, if, if there is no way of knowing God's purposes, or even that there is a God, because I think that, that the best thing you get out of Descartes' attempt at proving God's existence is sort of a vague deism, which informed the Enlightenment that came after. Um, I think what you're, what you're left with is efficiency, as the only standard you know how do we best make the most people happy you know or how do we help accomplish whatever goal and that's that leads to utilitarianism to a utilitarian yeah. view yeah. so the last part of this new manichaeism is this tendency towards relativism and utilitarianism in ethics mm -hmm. but again it all flows from really what descartes the, the dominoes descartes pushed over if you could say yeah, at the, at, towards the end of the book, you talk, I mean, about JP2's um, metaphysical, he talks about we have metaphysical reflection and then lived experience. But he says that we come to know the good, the true, and the beautiful first and primarily through lived experience. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by the concept um, 
that of a four-year-old child. I usually say right around three or four years old. If you have two children and you give one of them two cookies and you give one of them five cookies, immediately by the age four, the one who gets two cookies will say, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, we all have that concept from when we're very young. It's probably our first understanding of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Is that it's <laughs> not fair. <laughs> Um, so we, we have this built-in understanding at a very young age of, of this, you know, being, and that the being of the cookies is a good, and that everyone should have some equal amount of them. Um, and yet somehow we seem, so it's almost like Descartes' ideas and the, the, the new Manichaeism has to be learned in college or somewhere along in the culture because it's certainly not what we understand from experience right. from the time we're very young. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that you bring up an, an incredible and an insightful point. And the reason why is I think that what John Paul II is trying to do is in his particular anthropological method is, especially you can see this in the theology of the body, is get at what he calls original experiences, right? Right. Those foundational experiences that are for every human person that are in the depth of their soul as a person. Hmm. So you're right. I think right. that the pneumatichism comes to us basically on, through the ideas that have become part and parcel of the fabric of Western culture. And, and young people are just kind of like raised in it. It's like I use the analogy in the book of like the pneumatichism being like John Paul's diagnosis of the spiritual disease infecting the culture and the family. And I mentioned his anthropology as, as a cure or an antidote, right? Um, but if, so I, I would say that this, this disease of a pneumatichism is caught, but it's airborne. It, like, like people just breathe it in as right. they're live in their daily lives in our culture and that informs their worldview well i think therefore i am it sounds cool you know <laughs> it's, it's got that you know college brilliant ring to it and um realizing that you know i am therefore i think is just you know sounds all upside down and backwards until you realize the consequences of you know of I think therefore I am um, that it and I and I think that that's a that's a very um, important thing to get is that like you're mentioning that the people are kind of learned this they've got this through social learning this is why I think John Paul II uses the phrase manichaeism while he's talking about philosophical ideas he uses like a religious sect you know as the analogy but if you think about how religions operate they're they're really fundamentally transmitted like through culture right 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 you know and and i think that he as a result sees this as more akin to something that is caught and that people kind of just embrace as part of the cultural fabric than a debate among philosophers um, it informs a worldview. Religion is a worldview. It's a way of seeing and thus a way of acting. And on some level, too, a way of worshiping, if you identify that we are we, what we worship or that we worship what we love, right? right. So, like, in this sense, you can even see, you, you even so, sort of see a sort of contradiction in this because think about the new Manichaeism you don't have a bunch of people going out there, you know, with self-denial as the principle, right? right? You have right. actually a hedonistic self-enjoyment as the principle, which, mm -hmm. which to make a relationship to, to ancient Manichaeism and medieval Manichaeism, the auditors, not the elect, had a relaxed morality. And quite often, the, the Manichaean elect turned a blind eye to the incredibly immoral sexual practices of the auditors mm -hmm. that... Um, that basically indulged the sexual urge, but the, 
they were allowed to do so as long as they avoided marriage and procreation. Yeah, because, that was an interesting. You know, like, and of course, we see that today. Right, exactly. Right. So this this right. this contemporary Manichaean neo Manichaean culture is governed by what John Paul II called a contraceptive mentality. You know, yeah. that that starts with a denial of there being intrinsic ends to sex, namely life, procreation, and love union. Right. right. Um, right. But but also tries to uh, reduce the person to an object of use and a source of pleasure, which is utilitarian, a utilitarian attitude. Well, you talked about, or he talks about, and you talk about in the book, the, the, that avoiding, pro, avoiding procreation and the idea that children are just this miserable burden to be avoided at all costs. Right. Um, and, and we see also with that the replacement of children with dogs, which I find very interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we're no longer naming the, the we're, we're naming the animals. We're no longer naming the children. We're naming the dogs. The dog has become. I mean, I know people. They have grand dogs. They don't have grandchildren. You can they see would, those stickers on people's cars. <laughs> right, the dog, the cat, and the dogs, um, and and the child becoming this obstacle to personal fulfillment. Going back to these feelings that people start with of you know I want to have a boat and a vacation and travel the world um but then as they get older you know somebody said to me the other day your dog's not going to do much good for you when you're in assisted living <laughs> and you need somebody to advocate for you your dog isn't going to advocate um and there we see the breakdown of the family the really deeper breakdown of the family and and people being viewed as precious and sacred in themselves um you have this society that doesn't want the burden of children and then it doesn't want the burden of the elderly, you know, that normally the children took care of the elderly, the elderly took care of the children. Right. Um, so you have this whole breakdown of the family. Happening. Well, you can also see in that, even in the, the way in which our culture um, disregards the elderly as the, somehow equating the person with their ability to produce, right? Mm. So their value is connected to production which is essentially utilitarian, right? right? It's not, it's not intrinsic. And this is also why people is like, the, I, I, you'll hear this routinely too, when people talk about their minds going and they say, oh, before I get to that point, get rid of me. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say that. And I think yeah. part of that is just, they don't want to be a burden to people. So like, I think there's a part of that that's just them saying, I don't want to impose and have somebody else have to take care of me. Right. That, a, we've heard that a lot. You know, we, my, my mother-in-law used to say that a lot. I don't want to be a burden. And I would say, you're supposed to become a burden. <laughs> That's how we learn to handle burdens. You know, I tell my kids, I will become a burden. That's to teach you something. You right. And it's also to teach us something. I mean, I think this right. is the thing, like, we, we have to, not only do we learn humility by having to rely on other people, but we have to allow ourselves to be loved right and there's a sort of myth of independence that we gain right so so in this sense like um but it, my only point is that i think that like what you see there is this attitude that somehow i am my mind so when my mind goes i'm not there so just you know um just let me go or maybe put me out depending on what state you live in or what country you know like and and I think that this is one of the things that's so tragic. And so you get it at both ends of the, of the sanctity of life spectrum, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so the, the burden, though, of children, quote unquote, that is so heralded by our culture that they're an obstacle to fulfillment mm -hmm. is very neo Um and, and yet they're not willing, people are not willing to sacrifice sexual pleasure. <laughs> right and so what you wind up with is a contraceptive mentality which basically reduces persons to to objects of use for sexual pleasure right. um, and, and people making as pope francis as shipwrecks of their lives right because the stories are just sad you know that come out of that i mean it starts with pleasure but it never ends with pleasure no no um, no, I, have so a, I have a question for you. Um, one of the things in the book talked about how 
feelings begin with the intellect. You have to know something in order to feel something about it. So you have an intellectual judgment of something, and then feelings come from that, and then you reflect on that, and then you sort of recognize good and evil through that reflection. But there was an initial judgment of the intellect that led to feelings. Mm -hmm. Am I correct with that? Yeah, so basically what you're referring to is the way in which John Paul II was talking about, well, really Carol Wojtyla in the acting person, talking about um, how we come to the sense of moral values, right? Okay. But what, what he's responding to is the idea that somehow moral values come to us through feelings, right? right? And therefore would be pre predominantly subjective. And what John Paul II held was that while it's true that there, there's such a thing as moral feelings, we feel a certain way about something as good or as evil, right. or upon reflecting how we've acted, we might come to a sense of something as having been good or evil by feel, how we feel about it, either feelings of approval or disapproval or what have you. Um, yeah. It all stems first and foremost from a certain knowledge of what is good and what isn't. And so it can't be separated from the intellect. That is the existence of an objective good, of a good that exists in reality, as opposed he's, to merely a good that exists within me in feelings. Okay, so is he saying that you have to know that objective good? That was my question. Because I have, I'll, I'll go back to why I'm asking it, but is he saying you have to intellectually know that objective good or just that that objective good has to be there? Well, I think first and foremost, depending on what you're discussing, he would suggest that there has to be some value that's ascertained by the intellect, um, however it is ascertained that way. I, he, he doesn't think that metaphysical reflection is the only way to get at truth. He obviously yeah. talks about um, the, the knowledge of truth that happens and comes through experience, right? So that's important. Um, but experience should lead us to this objective truth and this reality that points to it. So I was just I think, wondering, think, because, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, please. Well, I, I've recently been working with a woman who, she was brought up Catholic, so she had some Catholic, you know, sort of cafeteria Catholic but had long ago left the church um, and, um, in her, you know, older, um, had, had older children and during the pandemic became pregnant. And in, 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 in an absolute panic and fear, um, had an abortion. And, um, you know, at the time, it, she, she felt like this, quote unquote, was the right thing to do. Um, it was, she was terrified of the pregnancy her husband was also in a panic. So it wasn't a situation of a single parent. There wasn't a question of economics. It was just, oh my God, I can't start my life over with two children. And, um, and so she went for the abortion, had the abortion. Um, so there didn't seem to be a whole lot of intellect happening there. Right. Um, but the feelings that followed the abortion were horrific to the extreme i mean ap appropriately horrific right. um to the action um to the point where she and her husband almost like couldn't live with what they had done um just total depression devastation you name it go down the list and it, and, and this followed the abortion very quickly um i mean in the end god has been writing straight with crooked lines she has come back into the church the whole family is coming to the church. Her mm. husband, who was completely unchurched, is coming into the church. Um, so it's, it's, there's been a lot of miracle associated with this, this horrific act. But it seems to me that feelings were what led to her intellect being informed right. rather than the other way around. So I just wanted to ask you about that. It was yeah, okay, this is a good, this is a good point. Um, well, I think that there's a few things that I could say. One of the things is that keep in mind that what John Paul II is trying to at one and the same time um, highlight, but also caution against, is this idea that, well, to say that feelings do not play a role in our moral life 
is yeah. is just not not yeah. what, making any sense of our experience, right? Right. <laughs> uh, but yet, on the other hand, we can't have like a sentiment, a sentimentalizing or completely subjectivist viewpoint of morality and moral values, as if somehow it's the feelings that create the values, right? Right. right. Um, and that would just lead to relativism, which of course is where we have seen a lot of the culture and what John Paul II saw. So, so what he's trying to do is acknowledge the one, but say, hey, these feelings have to be tied into something that is objectively true. Real. Um, yeah. And real. And um, even the feelings on some level are going to follow that, that recognized Reality. That reality. So, yeah. So like, so for example, and this is where you have the natural law, God is written in our hearts. You know, <laughs> I would I would argue if I could draw, I mean, obviously I don't know this woman at all, but if I could draw an interpretation, I would say she probably always knew the really right thing deep down. This is like the fundamental when you penetrate into people's hearts, when you right. get deep down. And you can help put them in touch with the truth that has been, been written in their heart, right? What happens is these other concerns and values wind up suffocating that to some degree. So like her fear, her worry, her concerns about whatever the different things were that, she, that were working on her, they, they became the thing she saw and the real truth she couldn't see deep down below, you know? And so they sort of clouded, and that's what she stopped at is what was true. But it wasn't what was really true, you see. Yeah. It wasn't the deeper yeah, truth. And then yeah. after this act, the, the pain she felt had plunged her down into the reality of that deeper truth, you yeah. see. And, I, and that's what, I think, evoked the sense, the sense of guilt, yeah. shame, uh, ultimately repentance, you know, like, and, and all these sorts of things that you described happened with her mm. and her husband. Um, yeah. so, so that objective natural law written on the heart is also part of the objective reality. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's right. Part I think of it, it is. I think it is. And so, so in that sense, I think that you can, the, the difficulty today, and this is what I would say the new Manichaeism does, is it's part of that cloud or, or barrier that blocks us from seeing the truth because we've been raised in a culture that accepts these certain ideas about ourselves and the world and 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 creation in general and we just kind of go with that yeah so what does the theology of the body do now this is a, you know i spent a lot of years teaching the theology of the body to i probably had the grace of preparing some 4,000 plus couples for the sacrament of marriage yeah, yeah. by That's giving awesome. these theology of the body workshops. It's exciting. It is a very <laughs> exciting thing. I could tell you that overwhelmingly, when, you, when I would share the theology of the body with people, their response was, how come we've never heard this before? Hmm. You know, like, and, and then they would say something like, this, this is saying what I've always known and I wish somebody had told me. Like, imagine that phrase. This is saying what I've always known, but I wish somebody had told me. Huh? That's, that's yeah. acknowledging that something else got in there. Right. But deep down, they always knew. They always knew that whatever they were doing by sexually sinning wasn't bringing them the fulfillment they were told it was supposed to. They always knew there was something of an emptiness that resided in that. They always knew that this was made for something more. You know, yeah. they always knew that, but yet they were going with the ideas mm -hmm. that were fed them by the culture. And then you kind of come up and you share this and it puts them in touch with what's underneath that barrier. Right. <laughs> for a lack of a better image. It's interesting. My husband and I kind of came into the Catholic Church kind of backwards. We were, I was in a secular institution, the University of Rhode Island, but with a Catholic professor. And he gave a completely secular you know, non-theological argument against contraception in, a, in an ethics class. And it made sense. <laughs> um, so we stopped, con we'd been, we weren't Catholic, we'd been contracepting for seven years, and we just stopped. It was like, because look, I have an argument that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's not theological, but it's, and I've used it since, like at the seminary when I taught, 
I said, you don't need to bring God in. The church has reasons for what it teaches yeah. that aren't theological. They're philosophical. And it always fascinates seminarians that there is non-theological reasons for rejecting contraception. So we first rejected contraception. Then we rejected abortion. Then we rejected homosexuality. And then we said, wait a minute, our church, we were, ang we were Anglican Episcopalian at the time. We're like, our church doesn't reject any of these things. Right. We got to get out of here. You yeah, know, it's funny so how the minute you start pulling those bricks out of the wall, the wall starts to collapse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, and I think you bring up a, an interesting point that's related to John Paul II's very approach, because obviously he's steeped in Thomistic metaphysics, right? right? So he believes there's an objective truth, and he believes that there needs to be an intellectually rigorous argument, right? Right, right. But yet he's saying that that metaphysical reflection is not um, without a secondary aspect. And that is this appeal to experience, right? right? A an appeal to the human heart and to the um, subjective experience of the person. Yep. And what, what you find, and this is an interesting line from the theology of the body, when he's talking about Genesis 1, I was amazed yeah. by this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah I had to funny. put that together. That so, was yeah. cool. He talks about this like objective metaphysical content about God creating the world, like it's like yeah. from the outside looking, right? And then he and talks that's about the first story, right? Yeah. And then the second story of creation, it's almost like from the point of of human subjectivity, yeah. right? Like, I'm alone. I'm alone in this thing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so the man and the woman's subjective experience. So. What John Paul II said is this, that subjective experience is the same, con is connected to the objective reality, right? Mm -hmm. So human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. It just states that as an objective fact. But what human beings experience in those fundamental experiences are related to their creation objectively as the image and likeness of God. Yeah, that was fascinating. You know, I've read Theology of the Body, but I'd never made that 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 I that connection with um, one is the, the the objective metaphysical state of things, and the other is the subjective um, personal experience of being created. Right. And, uh, and so when you when you can with people, I think John Paul II's approach was intellectual rigor, but in a way that taps into the experience of the human person and right. particularly the fundamental experiences. Right. What, is, what, is, what is the truth that's being revealed in what has been experienced, right? Yeah. And, and so leading them through the subject of experience to the objective reality and truth is yeah. very much what the theology of the body was, at least in its method, trying to accomplish, right? So in this sense, I, I mentioned that, well, maybe a, an objective method like Thomas's scholastic method is helpful. And actually in classes, I found it to be very helpful among students who don't regard theology as really being an intellectually rigorous thing. So when you start breaking out St. Thomas Aquinas and you've got syllogisms left and right, and he's like, oh, this guy's like, wow, he's off the chart. So you can't like, you can't say, well, gee, you know, he's not as smart as this scientist, you know? Um, yeah. But on the, on the other hand, that might in, introduce something into the intellect, but it doesn't always happen like you, where you knew it, and then that changed, that made you reflect, and you guys had to change your behavior, and you started to move through the dominoes, right? Yeah. For, for some people, it's like bringing that up, but then having that come into contact with what's even deeper within the heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that combo is a winning combination, so... So we're, we're starting to run out of time, and I have a question. So most people in the culture aren't going to read Theology of the Body. And realistically, most people in the culture aren't going to read your book either. No. Because so, <laughs> your audience was clearly people with philosophical and some theological background, like myself. Um, and, and other people that we know that have, you know, survived like Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And uh, 
So my question is, how do we, how do you, I mean, you're talking about your ministry, certainly to married or, you know, people that are preparing for marriage, but how do we simplify theology of the body and your book, this message and get it out to Joe Schmo down the road, you know, the, the kid on Facebook. Um, I think of young people, I, I keep as many people connected on Facebook, even though they probably all totally disagree with me, but I hang on to them as friends, no matter what they post, unless it's obscene, um, in hopes of reaching people. So how would you simplify this message? I want you to write a children's book. All right. No, <laughs> all, uh, you know, I'll with, leave it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here, if we look at the the fundamental aspects of the new Manichaeism that have to be like, you might want to say undone. And I were to say, how can you simply respond? I would say, well, first, your body is you. So that's that's number one. Your body is you. You are your body. Uh, you can see this by the fact that when you if you get your arm hurt, you say, I'm hurt. You don't say, you know, exactly. You identify that as you. You that, touched me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if, if your body is you and you are in some level a body, you know, then if you are creating the image and likeness of God, that image and likeness of God includes the human body. And being made for love in the image and likeness of God means that love includes the human body. Love understood as, as the sincere gift of yourself. So if we're giving ourselves, we give ourselves in and through our bodies because we are our bodies. Now, now, of course, in the realm of sexuality, you know, when you give yourself totally, when you give your body totally, you give yourself totally. This is a really straightforward, um, you might want to say, argument for the church's teaching as to why sex belongs exclusively in marriage. Because it's only through marriage that two people give themselves, including their whole lives, totally to one another. And thus, it's only within marriage that, that the total gift of their bodies in the sexu in sexual union speaks the truth, that they are totally one another's, right? right. So, um, so that would be first. You are your body, and that your body is you. Um, and what you do with your body, you do. What people do to your body, they do to you. And when you give your body, you give you. Um, the second thing I would say is that... Um, God has created the world, and God had something in mind when he did so. So Aristotle once said that, you know, all, you know, all persons act for ends, right? <laughs> like, and so in this sense, there's nothing that we do that we don't do for a reason. Well, it's foolish to think that God does something, and you were to ask God, why did you create this? You just go, you know, like, so it's just silly to think that. So if God created you for a reason, if he created the human person for a reason, what is that reason? If God created sex for a reason, what is that reason? And how can we know what that reason is? Um, I think that this is very important. And so understanding that God creates for reasons and also accepting that we can know something about what God has created and the purposes for which he created it first by natural reason, but also, of course, by revelation, then, uh, then we can understand why God made things. You know, and, and this is the thing. When, when you get something like, let's say you, you buy some product, usually there'll be like, you know, a manufacturer's guarantee on it. But the manufacturer's guarantee only applies if you use the product for what it's used, meant to be used for. If you decide to take it and use it for something else, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to, if you took your new, you know, uh, pizza stones and decided you were going to use them as discuses, you know, like, and they broke, you can't go to the pizza stone company and say, hey, I want my money back. Manufacturer's guarantee. You're like, well, what'd you do with this? Like, I threw it across my yard. We're like, what are you talking about? You know, like, so in a similar way, I think that if we can understand what God, that God has desired for us to know happiness and fulfillment. But that happiness and fulfillment, that manufacturer's guarantee, you could say, is only going to come about by using things the way God intended them to be used, by acting in accordance with his purposes. With, right. you know, and so then what you see is that, wow, this is, God is not opposed to my happiness. He wants my happiness, but he knows the way to happiness 
is by following his plan for creation. And so, you know, I think that that's another, if you could say a simple way of saying it, you know, that there yeah. is such a plan. Um, yeah. And that that plan for creation, the good he proposes for us to choose, and the evil he warns us and says we should refuse, is all about loving as he loves and finding the happiness our hearts seek. So, I had a confirmation class I had to teach recently. I was sort of like thrown in as their final speaker and at the end, I, I pulled out, I said, I'm going to pretend I have a lollipop here. And I opened up the lollipop and I licked it. And then I said, okay, now I want you going to pass it on. And I want you to each lick the lollipop. And they went. <laughs> so they're like, you know, getting more and more grossed out as they pass the lollipop around. And they're like, what is the point of this? And I said, well, John Paul II wrote this really cool thing called Theology of the Body. I said, not theology of the soul, theology of the body. And I said, in theology of the body, John Paul II says that you are a lollipop. I said, you are a lollipop. So I said, don't be like passing your lollipop around <laughs> for everybody to lick. I said, you are this precious, amazing, sweet, delicious, wonderful lollipop. So you might want to just like be really careful with your lollipop and, you know, maybe in marriage you will share yourself with one other person, but you don't want to pass your lollipop around to everybody. And you can see they, they were, they were interested. The kids were interested in this concept well, it's, that the it's, body it's, was precious. Right. Because it reveals a person who's created in the image and likeness of God. Right. That there's an right. objective truth about who they are and what their value is right. is identified with this body right. you know like and and i think that this is key so if i'm made in the image and likeness of god for love and god creates me with the body then it is in and through the body that that image and likeness of god is brought into the world into the visible reality of the world right. and and either I act in a way that is consonant with that dignity or a way that's not. And I think that what, what you talked about, that conflict that can exist in people's hearts, they're going along accepting this view that I'm not my body, you know, that, that I'm my consciousness and my body can be used for whatever I want. But then they go and try to use their body for whatever they want, and they experience a dissonance. Right, pain. a shipwreck. Right? Oh, so, and so it's just the reality is not that way, you know. Um, and and it's that like subjective experience I think that we can use as a springboard, you know. Um, the fact of the matter is that the people who are the least happy are the people in our culture living a hedonistic lifestyle who are screaming about how happy they are because they have to scream so loud that they eventually try to believe it, right? right? They're trying to convince themselves by screaming so loud. Yeah. And, um, and to me, that's a great sadness. And that's why it is very I sad. this message. But the, obviously this book is made for scholars and for those who have, are well-read. Um, but the concepts in it are absolutely, I think, real and practical in the absolutely. sense that... Um, but I thought it was important to, to, for a lot of reasons to show forth a little bit of uh, an intellectual rigor with regards to this. because It's a wonderful trying... book. It's, it's really Thank wonderful. You. Yeah. Thank and it you. flows very nicely and logically. You're a clear writer, clear thinker. It was wonderful to read. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, hopefully so, it gives people a broad... I, one of the things I'm hoping for is that people come to appreciate the real breadth of what John Paul II was trying to do. Because I think, like, the theology of the body can get reduced. You know, like, it gets reduced. It's just about sex. It's just about marriage. But it's not. It's, it's really about John Paul II trying to present the, uh, the Christian view of creation and on, on the human person. And... And that's going to include and involve a conversation about the body and sex and masculinity and femininity. But, but he's trying to get at something far deeper. And he's trying to address something far broader and pervasive in the culture. And that was one of my hopes is that people would really start to see, wow, what he was doing was something much more, much more um, 
significant and broad. Not that not that what he says about sex and marriage in it isn't significant, um, but that he was trying to accomplish a whole lot more than what often the theology of the body is reduced to. Does that make sense? So absolutely, I, it's just brilliant. I I knew when I read it that it was brilliant that you know it, people would be digging through layers of it, the way we have with the Summa Theologica, we'd be digging through layers of theology of the body for, for you know, the next hundred years, um, because it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was exciting well, to see another layer of it come out in your book. Well, thank it's, you. It's beautiful. And this yeah. has been beautiful spending this time with you. I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk about the book and to talk with you and meet you and everybody there at Holy Apostles. So what's your next book? You're working on something? Uh, yeah, actually, I am. I'm doing research. Um, it's sort of related. Uh, but in The Theology of the Body, John Paul II talks about, actually, it's a phrase from Paul Ricoeur. He talks about the masters of suspicion in one of the audiences. The masters of suspicion are Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. And what John Paul II does in a very, like, very, it's a very quick thing that he writes and he just drops it i love when people do that they like make this illusion and then like they just like leave it alone but he associates each of the masters of suspicion with one of the threefold concupiscence so oh, yeah, so he, he refers freud to lust of the flesh uh nietzsche is pride of life and marx is the lust of the eyes I remember this right. from Father Milady at Holy Apostles, yeah. yes. So, so <laughs> basically, uh, in John, 1 John chapter 2, John says that um, all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away, right? So basically, the, the, the working title of the book is Not of the Father, and the subtitle is The Masters of Suspicion and the Threefold Lust. And oh. what I'm going to do is dig into the writings of Freud, uh, Marx, and Nietzsche, uh, explain why they, if you might want to say, exemplify this particular lust, and ultimately show that their worldview, which is profoundly atheistic and and um, anti-Christian is impossible to reconcile with Christianity because it's not of the Father. And unfortunately, one of the things that many people don't know is that contemporary critical theory is actually steeped in Freudian Marxism. That like the ideas of Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx that really kind of all merged at the Frankfurt School, which is where critical theory comes from, um, really do flow from them. So like part of the idea behind this is to be a critique of critical theory and say like what we see so much in the world today motivating a whole lot of agendas is really not something that's, that's Christian and shouldn't be an approach that's accepted and applied to a Catholic worldview. See, so, okay. so well, fundamentally, uh, that's to, my next I'll look year. forward to an interview <laughs> next year, then. <laughs> well, pray for me. You know, it's getting through some of this reading is tough, so. Uh, it is, and finding the time with children and grandchildren. That's my, that's the tough one. Well, and speaking of prayer, you want to end us with prayer, please? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you and give you all the praise for any good that was done in this interview. Uh, may it have touched hearts, may it have inspired minds, may it encourage people to look, look more deeply um, at these ideas, and in particular at the, at the work of John Paul II as an attempt to remedy the, um, the ills and errors of our time. So dear Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us, bless the listeners, bless all of our families, and we ask you as well to continue to strengthen us to share your good news and your truth with this world that you love and gave your life for. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Thank you. It's been a great interview. This has been David Hyduck and Healing the Culture and the Family. And I'm Kiki Latimer, and this is the Catholic Bookworm. And David, thank you so much. And hopefully I'll see you again. Sounds great. God bless you. Again. God bless. Thank you.